My interviewee today is the Reverend Pat Hemstock, or as I call her, Mum. Pat has been ordained for 29 years. And when she was first called into the priesthood, women weren't allowed to be ordained priests. Before she recently retired, she had been an incumbent of two churches in the Diocese of Sutherland, Nottingham. Her first being a church in massive decline, which had just a handful of people when she started, and then saw significant revival to become a vibrant church. Pat is married to Julian, who is also an ordained priest, and at the moment they are both in 12-week lockdown and confined to their home in Nottinghamshire. So welcome, Pat. It's good to have you here. It's good Thank to, you. It's good to be able to see that you're okay. I like using Zoom because I can see how you're doing. <laughs> and I can make sure you're okay as well, of course. Absolutely. I've had to brush my hair, though, to go on Zoom, which is, you know... <laughs> the only time I brush my hair in lockdown is when I'm on a Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you coping with the lockdown what are you doing to keep yourself busy well we've sort of got into this routine um in some in some ways which sort of lurches from breakfast to lunch to dinner to going to bed again um but we've we've done some jobs around the house that needed doing and uh, julian's got some jobs done that he wanted to do not least taking apart a clock that hadn't worked for years We've done um, some small jobs in the garden um, and we've watched lots of things um, on the television that we've videoed that we never got time to, um, to watch. So we've been doing things like that. We've also had several Zoom meetings each week, one of which is a virtual coffee morning with members of our congregation, one with members of my family um, and another one with members of the family. Um, and also we have a weekly um, quiz with the drive, the, uh, the, the road where we live, with everybody off the road where we okay. live, which is quite good fun really. So we, we're finding plenty to do. Good. So does that mean you have to brush your hair as well? <laughs> That's right. When I'm going on a Zoom meeting. You're going on yes. Zoom meeting, you have to put, brush your hair and put your lippy on. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think has been the hardest thing about lockdown? What have you missed the most? Um, well, I, I would say family. Um, we talk to them on Zoom. Um, we talk to the children, um, but that's really that's really hard. Um, but the other thing is, it is the people, um, the people and friends at church, and being part of that church community. Even though we see them once a week on Zoom, it is quite difficult because we can't. Um, have time with them and, and our, our communal worship of course doesn't happen in the same way yeah so yes I think those are the things that we've missed most yeah I mean it, it's amazing that we can use you know tools like zoom and facetime and all those sorts of things but they're mm. not a substitute are they really no you know? no they aren't I can't I can't give them a hug on zoom no no um, absolutely absolutely so Cast your mind back then to the to the time when you first heard the call from God um, to be a priest, bearing in mind that you couldn't be a priest at that point. Tell me about that time and, and how did you hear the call? What happened back then? Well, um, Julian was um, a reader at that time um, and we thought that, it, it, we always thought eventually he would go into being a priest um, and he decided he would then start to go forward to do that which he, which he's put into place but somehow the whole thing just wouldn't work we just couldn't make it work somehow um and then after quite some time of struggling with all this i just saw something and said i think it's me um i think i need to be doing it as well um and as soon as i said that everything just fell into place um, which was quite a strange um, thing, really. But we um, we did, you know, we struggled with it for quite a long time. Um, but I always thought, as we were going to theological college and and getting ready for all this, which is quite a big thing, um, I always thought that I'd just end up being 
like an appendage to what Julian was doing. I thought he'd be doing it and I'd just be sort of, you know, hanging on at the side. Mm. Um, and it was a bit like, um, the st I, I, I always think of it as a story of Abraham going up the mountain with Isaac um, because God told him to do this and off he went. And when he got there, God said, ha ha, I didn't mean it, you haven't got to do it. And I thought that's what would happen, you see. I'd go off, do what he said, and I'd get there, and I'd get to the end of me two years, and God would say, ha ha, I didn't mean it, um, you haven't got to do it. Um, but by the time I got to the end of those two years, I was so convinced that that was what I needed to do. If he had have said, ha ha, I don't mean it, I would have been devastated. Yeah. So I changed my whole thought over those two years, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 29 years later, do you still think he's going to let you off the hook at some point? <laughs> no, no, I don't think ever. Well, you don't retire. You don't retire from this job. You stop getting paid, but you don't retire. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're never not a priest, are you, I guess? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> So how did it feel when you got to the end of those two years at theological college, the end of your theological training, and you knew that God was calling you to be a priest and you, you were convinced that that's what you needed to do, but you couldn't be ordained a priest at that point? That's right. That was difficult. And, and we were in a church where um, the vicar didn't believe in the ordination of women. So that made it doubly difficult, really. But um, I mean, it didn't, it, it didn't matter um, for that as far as that went, because we knew before we went there that that was his opinion. Um, but we were okay, we were all right. I was very excited when I first of all started in ministry. Um, and our training incumbent said to me one day, Pat, it's taken God 2000 years to get here and you want it all finished by next Thursday. And, and that was really the way that I, I, I was just excited. I wanted to go and do it. Mm. Have, you, have you kept that excitement? You know, that, yes. that, that initial excitement that you had when you were very first of all ordained. Have you, mm. Has that excitement stayed with you? Yes, yeah. Um, I, I think I, I can't believe that I can get up in the morning um, and know that I was doing something that I loved doing so much. And I had to get up every morning and do it and think, I can't believe how blessed I am to be doing this. And not only that, I was getting paid for it. <laughs> um, you know, which, which was really, really lovely. And so I don't think I've ever lost it. Okay, so you have real dreadful days when people are difficult or, you know, things happen that aren't nice. Mm. But most of the time, yes, I, I'm still that, I still got that excitement. Even now I'm retired. Now you're retired, you get to do all the good bits of the job and not the bad That's bits. That's right, yes. Yeah. So I don't have to do annual general meetings or <laughs> <laughs> uh, statistic returns or whatever, the awful things. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so looking back on obviously quite a long career in the church, because you were eventually ordained a priest um, once, once we were allowed to be, um, what would you say have been the highlights of? Uh, of working for God over that time? I've tried to think this through and I think the most important thing to me is like being a midwife. I feel like I'm a midwife quite often because we're bringing people to faith and that's the most important thing that we do. If we're just there to look after people or to um, just be social workers, that's all we end up being. We're there primarily to bring other people to faith and for the church to grow and for it to carry on. And so I always think that the thing about me being a midwife was the most important thing I've, I've done. But there's also things like being there for people in their ups and downs in their lives. It's being part of people's lives. And you meet people on a very, very deep level um, especially when you do something like a funeral visit where you meet them on a very very deep level mm. um, straight away um, because you're there at, at a very difficult time for them or they're at a very happy time um, you know and we're doing weddings or baptisms I love baptisms um, and, and it's being with people and being part of their lives yeah. yeah it's a privilege isn't it to be able to 
to be allowed into somebody's world Jeez. at the most yeah. you know right. sort of life-changing yeah. moments in their you know yeah, yeah. It's, it is a privilege to be able to do that yeah I, I just love doing alpha courses and nurture courses we and we've done lots of things um I think I'm, a, I'm an undercover teacher really I love doing things like that I love sharing things with people um and I even did some teaching on zoom the other day which was quite an experience I can tell you I'll bet. um but um but it was um it was just lovely being able to share my faith and the things that that I've learned with other people and that's really quite important and Alpha does that of course in a nutshell yeah yeah do you think that Alpha has been a good tool for church growth yes I think I think it's the best I've, I've looked at others and I've used others but I always go back to Alpha because it's the best one I think mm. and it's easily accessible and and you can sort of um use it yourself we can use the the cds or the whatever um but but it's, it is really just so comprehensive which is lovely yeah yeah okay so if you've got a new curate who's just starting out in their you know mm. on their curacy and they've only just been ordained what sort of advice would you give to them what would be your big hot tip the first thing that I would say is be yourself. Um, you can't be anything else. You can't try and be something that you aren't. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I found that when I was going for selection or when I was doing my training, when I was in my curacy, that I, I, I is, is all that I've got. I haven't got anything else. I can't try and be something that I'm not. And so it was a matter of what you see is what you get. This is me, um, and this is who I am, and this is what you get. And I couldn't pretend to be something else. Mm. And I think that was the most important thing. Mm. The second thing would be to look after yourself. Um, this is not, um, sometimes this is not easy. Most of the time it's lovely, but there are some times when it's easy. And you need to look after yourself. Make sure you have your days off. Make sure that you've got some recreation. Do something different. When we were curates, we were um, told that you put God first. You put your family second and the church third. And that's something that we've tried to, to remember to live by. And that is really important. And, and the, the other thing I would say is just enjoy every minute of it because it's lovely. Having been an incumbent of a church that did see um, quite a big revival, um, I seem to remember I, I'd already left home by the time that you started there, but, um, but you did, which is probably going to give people my age away, actually, but anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but I know I wasn't around when you first of all started um, uh, uh, in Baseford. Um, so tell me, you know, that church really did go from only having two or three people there on a Sunday morning. Um, mm. and, and it saw tremendous revival and tremendous growth. Um, uh, you know, what happened there and, and why do you think that that church saw the revival that it did? I think it it was about there's I think there's several things in this. It was about providing a welcoming atmosphere, giving people time, giving people a chance to talk and ask questions. It was about being there for people. Mm. But it was also encouraging that that atmosphere within the congregation. Mm. So as if a new person came in everybody was welcoming to them so what i did or what um you know the leadership did it it, it filtered through the congregation so everybody did it so if you've got a evangelistic atmosphere which is something i'm passionate about as you probably realize um it, it was important to me so it became important to others and it sort of spread that enthusiasm around and I think that was one of the things and it wasn't about me it was about the whole of the congregation taking responsibility for bringing other people to faith and they did it beautifully and with great great enthusiasm and very deep faith and I was very grateful for that yeah 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 so apart from having me 
What would you say <laughs> is your biggest achievement? What are you most proud of? I think seeing the, the churches grow. Um, and, and again, that's not about me. It's being about a part, of being a part of a group of Christians who are welcoming and encouraging those who are searching, and that to me is is the most exciting thing. Yes, having you and Pete was pretty good, really. <laughs> it has its moments, but um, but, but it, it is about seeing those those people come to faith. It is just you could give me a million pounds and it wouldn't mean as much as seeing a person come to faith. Throughout your work, you I know that you've always had quite, um, uh, obviously you've had a passion for the evangelism, but you've also had quite a lot of involvement in bereavement support, um, possibly more in later years than, than at the beginning of your career. Um, mm -hmm. What sort of advice would you give to people at the moment? Because whilst we're in lockdown, we can't hold funerals, we can't necessarily be mm -hmm. with our loved ones when they're at the end of their life. And obviously this is causing a lot of pain, and it's also causing a lot of difficulty for people. Um, so what sort of advice would you give to people who are bereaved at the moment and, and really struggling with that? Mm -hmm. I think this is, people keep saying this is unprecedented times, and it is. Um, um, it must be excruciatingly difficult. And I have spoken to several people who've been in that situation where a person has died and they haven't been able to be with them, or they haven't been able to have a proper funeral. Um, but what I would say to a bereaved or to any bereaved person really is just be kind to yourself. Remember that everything that happens to you is quite normal. People think when they're bereaved or when they're, they're cut off that they're going mad. They think they're the only person who feels like that. Just be kind to yourself. Remember that it's okay to feel the way that you're feeling. But also remember that you've lost that person but God is still with you and he will never leave you. Um, and just to try to get yourself, um, this, at this point in the time, this is difficult to do, but try to get yourself involved with other things like bereavement sport groups or, um, or even just church groups or community groups. Go and do something, get involved. But mostly just give yourself plenty of time. Don't try and rush it. And also, it, it's, it's still bad to the person who is bereaved when everybody else has forgotten about it and gone on with their everyday lives and they've still got it. Um, and that's when they begin to think, it must be me, but it's not. It's, it's what grief is. How, how do you sustain your own spiritual journey? Um, especially when we can't go to church, you know, at the moment we've got, <laughs> we've got no buildings. Um, and, uh, you know, we know that church isn't the building, church is the people. Um, but nevertheless, it's, we're not taking communion, are we? And, you know, tell me how um, are you sustaining your own spiritual journey? Well, through, um, I mean, we, we're having services um, uh, on a Sunday, which are which are uh, recorded and, and put through, and so we watch that. And when we watch yours, <laughs> so, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> <laughs> um, and watch the various things on um, through the screens. And I think that's been something that we've had to learn very quickly. Mm. But we have done it. Mm. Um, it's been nice to. Um, but you have to still be able to speak to other members of the church, even though we can't see them. We can see them on Zoom. Um, and in a couple of weeks' time, I'm starting a group with another lady from our church for people who are asking questions. Because at this time, a lot of people are saying, so what about God then? So where's God in all this? Yeah. Um, and so we're starting um, a Zoom group for people who are asking questions, one particular lady who's just started to come to church and then we went into lockdown um, and um, she just wants to ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So we're starting with her and anyone else who wants to join her. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of, um, there's still things happening mm -hmm. um, and that helps me mm -hmm. um, and, and helps, um, you know, helps us to keep, to keep the, uh, the things going keeping the the faith going yeah. i think and it keeps our faith going so it inspires us as well yeah. i think because when you're working with other people you learn as much and get to gain as much from it as they do yeah yeah 
Absolutely. So can you remember a time in your life when you felt particularly close to God? Um, we, is there sort of a, you know, when you look back, is there a sort of a time when you think, I really felt the presence of God working quite powerfully in my life at that point? Can you tell me about that? I think it would be very difficult to pick one or two out because there are loads and loads and loads. Um, and I used to see a man um, who prayed with me and he anointed me with oil that had been made from the recipe used for anointing in the Old Testament. Oh, wow. Which is quite fantastic, really. It's a beautiful, wonderful, musky smell. Mm. And now, whenever I feel the presence of God very near, I smell that smell. Oh, wow. Um, and other, other things where you can feel the presence of God, like rainbows have been very significant. I've seen rainbows at times when things have been very significant in my life when I'm looking for, you know, for a new job or waiting for um, those sort of things or very significant things in my life. I've seen rainbows. Mm -hmm. And so um, that probably hasn't asked you, answered your question, um, but it, it helps me to see those things, those things that are happening. Mm. And it's, it's amazing, isn't it, that um, at the moment we could have had any symbol at all in the country yeah. you know to symbolize unity and support mm -hmm. and we've chosen the rainbow and that wasn't a deliberate choice that just you know it's just happened it just it? happened yes and yet, of course yes. for christians the symbol uh, the symbol of a rainbow is this tremendous sign of god's promise yes. god's care for yes. his people um, mm. and all of a sudden we've got that symbol in every other house window across the country absolutely and just hundreds of them well i haven't seen hundreds of them because i've not been out <laughs> um but there's plenty along our road and you yeah. see pictures of them all over which is lovely because it is that it's that symbol of god's promise that he's, he's not leaving us and every time we look at somebody's window we see that god's still there is 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 still with us even in the midst of a flood yeah he's still there yeah. yeah, and we're definitely in the middle of a flood at the moment, aren't we? We certainly are. We certainly are. You know, when you get to heaven, <laughs> after you've sort of finished going, wow, <laughs> yes. what's, what's the first question that you're going to ask God? I used to joke that the first question I was going to ask God was, is my mum here? Ah, oh, yeah. Um, um, and I've sort of joked about that. But you know, uh, people often ask me about heaven because they because they think I've got a dog collar on. They think I should know. They say, what, "What's heaven like then?" And I don't know the answer to that, but I know one thing, and that that helps me to understand, and that is that heaven is the place where God is. And you know what? I don't care about all the other details. It doesn't matter if there's a golf course or if there's football or a garden or all these things that people want. Um, and so if it's the place where God is, I know that when we get there, we'll understand all things and we'll know all the answers. Um, and, and I think that even though I could, I could have a list, you know, I've got my little list of things I want to ask. And I mean, you wouldn't believe. Um, but I, I really do believe that when we get there, there won't be any need to ask because we'll understand. Yeah. Um, which also re moves us to understand that if heaven is the place where God is, um, hell has got to be the place where God isn't. And if you can have the most wonderful place with all your golf and your gardens and your whatever you want, but if God isn't there, that would be hell. Yeah, yeah. even if it's an amazing place. Yeah, no matter how nice it is. Mm. if god isn't there then that's how mm. yeah so you must have taken um hundreds and hundreds of funerals during your yes, career absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and you must have read out hundreds of eulogies um and, and you know lovely things that people say about those who have passed away mm -hmm. when it comes to your turn and i am making notes on this obviously <laughs> Well, I don't want it to happen very soon, just for the record. <laughs> um, 
Um, but when it comes to your term, what do you want to be remembered for? You know, somebody asked me this some time ago, and my answer then was, and it might seem a strange answer actually, but I want to be known for generosity. Okay. Um, that might be surprise, and I don't mean about money. Mm. I, I mean about giving people time, giving them attention, being generous with myself for other yeah. people. Mm. Um, and and so I think yes, okay. So you know, we take things to people who are ill, or you know, do some baking, or yeah, yeah, uh, that sort of thing, and we give money to charities and all that sort of thing. Mm. But I'm not talking about that sort of generosity. I'm talking about giving people part of myself when they needed it. Yeah. So you can take a note of that one. I've, I've made a note. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So tell me, what's your, have you got a favourite Bible passage and why? I have. I have. My favourite Bible passage is Psalm 43. Mm -hmm. um, because it talks about God being with us. It's, you know, when you go through the, the waters, he will be with you. When you pass through the fire, you will not be burned. All that, that is just such a comfort. Yeah. Um, because we will get our ups and downs. We, we're all going to go through them yeah. um, at one time or another, and that's going to happen. And it's just that lovely piece of scripture to hold on to. And, and it says... You know, do not be afraid for I am with you. And it says that several times in that psalm. Do not be afraid for I am with you. Um, and I've called you by name. You are mine. Mm. So it doesn't matter what happens. I'm still his. And so that's, that's my, if I had to choose one, because I know I love loads of them. But that's my favourite, I think. Okay. And so, what's, what's your favourite hymn or your favourite song? Um, are you, you, you're making notes of this from the funeral as well. well obviously, you? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> um, my favourite hymn is always To God Be The Glory. Um, and every time we've had any, any function or anything, you know, if we've... Uh, for my licensing for my parishes or Julian's licensing or for, you know, when it was our uh, silver wedding, the ruby wedding, we've always had to God be the glory because whatever I've done um, in my life is very, very tiny compared to what God's doing. And always, always he has to have the glory. It's not about me. Um, it's not about what I do. It's not about what I think. It's always him that has the glory. And it tells, that, that hymn just tells of the glory of God and the wonderful things of, that he's done. And when we sing it, it always lifts me, I think. Yeah. So, I, I, yeah, I do love that. I love loads of hymns. I love the modern hymns. Um, and um, every time we get a new one, I think, oh, lovely, I love that. Um, and then, but if I had to go back to one, that's the one I would go back to. Well, thank you very much, Pat, for giving up your time to be grilled by your daughter. It's been lovely <laughs> to hear you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me, and I hope you're all uh, you're all keeping safe and well. People, I've said that wrong. I'm going to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> My interviewee today is the Reverend <laughs> Pat Hemstock. <laughs> you don't make me laugh. <laughs> oh, right, I'll be serious, I'll be serious. I look at the camera. Yeah, don't look at me, look at the camera. <laughs> Please just cut this because I need to make me again. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> that might go in the bloopers. <laughs>